cover page of um, this session, um, which we are presenting it uh, Monday, 31st of July, 2023. Um, course number 123-122, Modalities for Life. And this is a sec second session, but part one of Anatomy of Biblical Genius. Um, and we're going to be covering three aspects. Um, three aspects. Um, genius in the Old um, Testament concealed. And then genius in the New Testament revealed. And then genius and intelligence today. And I hope to do this in 30 minutes. And But I'm going to begin with just a couple of minutes to show you to play this game and uh, take a look at this screen. Um, and uh, I want you to connect the dots. Tell me what are the differences that you see and what are the similarities that you see in this sequence? And um, there's a reason why, um, write it in the chat box. What, what are your thoughts? How are, how are these um, differences, how are these um, uh, differences the same? And how are they different? And I want you to focus on the difference. So I'll just give you a few moments to, to take a look. If you, if you notice the, the word anatomy, um, anatomy is has a has a, a perfect number seven uh, seven letters in the word anatomy. So but, uh, my wife has beautifully just given each uh, character uh, a color. But above that, what I want you to focus is above that there is a a string of um, dots. Analyze that string of dots. Look at it carefully. And then go down to the the triplet below the three sequence of uh, dots, and tell me what's the difference. Can anyone um, can anyone uh, tell me what is the um, uh, similarity and what is the difference? Okay, so you could put like maybe similarity colon. What's the similarity? between the first and the second the th and the third and the fourth? What's the similarity? And then what's the difference? Okay, anybody um, just like to give um, uh, a try there? Um, and if those who are watching the replay, um, what I am referring to is the front, the cover page of this tonight's session on modalities for life. It's uh, session number two of four sessions, but it's part one. And um, we are going to, the, the title is Anatomy of Biblical Genius, and it's the front cover of the slide pack. And on that front cover, there are four sets of dots. So I want you to tell me what is the, what is, similar about the sets and what is different just just type it in the in the chat box could you do that right now just give i'll, I'll give you a couple all right okay um nazelle uh uh all has seven dots okay good d equals sequence of colors are different okay good Iris says red is featured in the first three dots. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. oh. First red is featured in the first three dots. Ah, okay, I see what you're saying. Okay, the color, the red dot is okay. Yeah. You're not talking about Singapore, are you? <laughs> Happy National Day. <laughs> okay. Um, it's featured in the first three dots. Um, and okay. And then it's last in that first sequence above the word anatomy. Okay. And then Iris says pink 
is in the last three dots. Good. All right. Any anybody else have any uh, your observe your skill your powers? This is the time to switch on your powers of observation, please. The yellow, the yellow dot is orange. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, yeah, orange. It's in the uh, all of them are in the the second and fourth from first to fourth. Mm, okay. For first to fourth position. Okay. Thank yeah, you very position. much. Mm -hmm. um, Marvin mentioned that all have violets on the fourth. All have violets on the fourth. Mm -hmm. mm, the first sequence, the violet, the purple is in the first position. The second se sequence, the violet is in the fourth. Yes, correct. The, the third set, the violet is in the fifth position, I think. But you're correct. The violet is in the fourth position. Yes. All right. Very good. Um, uh, Elizabeth says color pink is featured both in the last dots. Okay. Color pink. Yes. Okay. I am looking at pink here. Yes. Yes. In the first one, in the first set, pink is actually in the fifth position, isn't it? In the first set, in the second set, pink is in the last position. And there's a reason for that, um, being in the last position. We'll find out in just a mo moment in the, the genius in the Old Testament concealed. And then genius in the New Testament revealed the pink is in the second last position. There's also a reason for that. And then genius in intelligence today that pink is in the last position. All right. Um, thank you for that, Elizabeth. And uh, um, um, uh, Zil, Zil, how do I pronounce your name? Sorry, I, I keep getting it wrong. Zil, Zil Dijan, is it? De La Cruz? How, how to pronounce that? Can you, can you teach me how to pronounce that? Z Ziljan? Ziljan? Is that correct? Did I get it right? Okay. Okay, apologies if I if I didn't get, get that right. It said, the dots may correspond to the meaning behind the acronym of anatomy. Mm, okay. Um, <laughs> not really. Uh, it just so happened that anatomy has seven words. Okay. Marvin says, um, I mean the first and the third. Okay, right. And then Iris says, Violet is not in the New Testament fourth, is not in the New Testament fourth position for Violet in the New Testament here. One, two, three. It's not in the fourth. Yes, it's in the it's in the fifth. There's a reason for that as well. Good. Um, and then Mar Marilyn says the colored dots are shuffled, anatomy, word, pastor. Hmm. Uh, okay, it's, it's shuffled, but it's not random. Okay, it's shuffled, but it's not random. There's an order to everything in God's creation, including genius. Hmm? I think we're looking at different sequence. Yes, correct. Um, all sets has the same color dots. Yes, good, Annie Faye. There are only seven colors, just like in music. You only have do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do, right? Um, in, in that sense, not the last do, but the do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti. So you've only got seven. And primary colors, the same thing in the rainbow. They say, you you know, um, seven. And many other things, That's we call it the pattern of seven. That's for another night. All right, so what are we dealing with here? In this, why am I starting with this sort of conundrum or puzzle for you, for your, for you to, to look at the sequence is correct, all right? Um, okay, Marvin says there's no yellow. Well, actually, uh, there is a kind of a yellow. It's, it's not exactly yellow, but it's a little bit more on the orange scale. Um, 
be, simply because yellow is often used uh, to highlight things. Yeah, so we kind of, okay. there's no black. Okay, um, Noventi says there's no black. Well, that's because in word processing, normally the, the, the fonts are black of the letters itself. And we wanted to differentiate uh, a little bit out from the content, from the visuals in the content. So that's probably the reason. Um, uh, if you if you notice the sequence, it has a meaning, and the sequence follows what we call discrete. Uh, it follows what we call discrete uh, revelation. Okay, so in this course, anatomy of biblical genius we are deriving identity or genius from a couple of things. And it is not the way that Jung or Freud would have approached it. In fact, it was very strange, but in October of 2017, when Lin and I were sponsored on a holiday to Europe, courtesy of Lindt Chocolate, which is based in Zurich. Um, they uh, gave us a year's worth of chocolate and two tickets to Zurich. And when we were in Zurich, I asked the Lord, what am I doing here? This was in 2017. So it's quite some time before COVID. And I saw the shadows and the, the interplay of the light and so on and so forth. And I found out that and I saw my own shadow. You know, this was in the morning on the hill. It was called Lindenhof Hill. You can actually Google for it and take a look at what that looks like. But that was the exact location where the word modality dropped into my spirit. Now, I did not know. Later on, I went back and I found out that Zurich was the hometown of a very famous psychoanalyst, a Swiss psychoanalyst, who also wrote and researched on human formation. And his ideas were very popular and became the basis for modern psychometrics, psychiatry and psychology. His name was Carl Jung. And he is sort of seen as the father of modern uh, sort of uh, uh, psychiatry. And his work was built upon a, another fellow who was actually a Jew whose uh, parents escaped Nazi Germany and they fled to America. And that was the Freud family. And so Sigmund Freud was the sort of the guru or the mentor of Carl Jung. And between the two of them, between Freud and between Jung, they sort of cornered the market, if you like, about uh, concerning um, what makes a person tick and what ticks him off. And they wrote many, many theoretical books and lived extremely, especially Freud, lived extremely um, sort of dodgy lives. Because you can imagine when you get somebody in the, uh, on the therapist's couch, they start pouring out all their inner details and their demons start coming out <laughs> as well. And if you don't know how to deal with them, then obviously you are going to open the door to uh, spiritism and all sorts of things. Okay. So uh, the, the name of this uh, professor or researcher was called Carl Jung. And he was born, he was raised, um, or, or rather he, he made his uh, life work the center of his uh, uh, his studies and his life work was in Zurich. And we were there in that same city and God gave or released modalities as an alternative to the madness um, and the over-medicalization of problems that are not medical in nature. And that's what you get when you pay hundreds of, you know, thousands of dollars to see these, uh, they call them shrinks, they give you medication because they can't answer your 
the deepest need of what you're looking for. Only God, unless they are Christian and they can lead you to, to Jesus and to the Father, then that's a different story. So in diagnostics, in the history of diagnostics, um, the city of Zurich is very important because out from Jungian psychology comes all the modern manifestations of uh, understanding individual differences. Okay, so um, I've we we've we, we've uh, tried to depict the archetypes in colors. And what we're saying is in our investigation, when we look into the scriptures, we find that there are actually only seven primary archetypes. And these archetypes have been identified. These archetypes are clearly seen in the life of people like Moses and David and Jonathan and Boaz and um, you know Noah and Joseph and you know and on and on and on it goes Eliezer you can actually see and the Lord has actually left his footprint or sorry his fingerprints in maybe footprint as well huh? he's left his mark all over the pages of scripture if only you have eyes to see it. And the sequencing that we have here, and, and this is really just an introduction because I'm gonna continue in this, um, in, in the theoretical, I'm gonna lay the foundation of the theory for biblical genius in the next session as well, part two. So we're going to cover four of the colors today. And then I think three of them next week. But the point is that we would like you to seriously look at which are the colors, first of all, that you are not. That means you can eliminate these colors from your, from your um, selection. And finally, eliminate down to the one color, the one dot that belongs to you, okay? And this has, again, as Paige uh, correctly mentioned, this has nothing to do with um, nationality or ethnicity, um, uh, language or religion, right? Um, this has to do with your modality. And modality is why you matter. So the example that we're giving in the Old Testament is from the, the tabernacle of Moses. And the example that we're giving genius in the New Testament is from 1 John chapter 2. Um, the, from Johannine literature. And then the, the uh, uh, gen genius and intelligence uh, today, we are showing you an example of how the agricultural um, uh, prosperity of Israel is harnessed using um, the same paradigm, but expressed in a different sequence and a different, same pattern, but a different sequence. And that is in Deuteronomy 8.8. 8. Um, <clears throat> and then all of that, said, both old and new, um, is sort of based on one, one set of verses in Romans 12, which in King's College, the way we teach modalities, I mean, other people can teach it in different ways, but the academic version of uh, modalities for life, we, hope we, we have our students to actually memorize or become familiar with, so familiar with seven Greek words, only seven, but they represent the colors of humanity, the full spectrum of God's, God the Father's glory, 
Okay, so the Father's glory <clears throat> is seen in humanity, but distributed across the human race in um, in the fullness of its of splendor and and um, diversity. So sometimes when you when you go to a church, you look at perhaps your own church, for example, you'll find that there is this diversity there that can be quite challenging, actually, because you may have people walking in from the members of public that have a totally different uh, modality than you, the modality of the pastor. And so it doesn't seem like it clicks, but the, if the pastor is clever or smart or seasoned enough to recognize that, hey, you need to have a whole bunch of people in your congregation because that adds specific value that you couldn't get any, anywhere else. So the rule of thumb is that you try not to stop people from coming to church because each of them, unless they're disruptive or for some reason uh, trying to infiltrate or something like that. But other than that, you welcome difference. So you're not trying to be, you know, uh, growing only uh, um, uh, in a in a homogeneous way, but you celebrate, you welcome, you recognize, and you celebrate differences, and and you have to train your eye, and that's what this course will do. It's it's actually a HR tool. It's it's actually the twenty first century um, evangelism explosion tool um, that, in my opinion. Um, su supersedes anything that's out there because everybody now wants to talk about themselves. It's the selfie generation and especially with a handphone and so on and so forth. So if they want to talk about themselves, especially millennials or the young people, then praise the Lord, talk about themselves. They need You need to talk about them. You need to know the condition of your sheep and your flocks and your herds, right? You start there. So they don't want to hear about God and Jesus and Holy Spirit and hallelujah, but they want to, oh, tell me about myself. Pastor, tell me about me, me, myself, and I. You see, it sounds very selfish, right? But don't condemn that. That is the way that this society has been geared and wired. So start there. Start with me, myself, and I, <laughs> but also teach them that it's all about you. You can use a famous uh, T-shirt saying that I have is all about you. It's all about you, but you are not what it's all about. Okay, I'm going to say that again. It's all about you, but you are not what it's all about. So when, when a minister, when you're in a leadership, a serving leadership position, you have no choice but to recognize and embrace and, in fact, celebrate the differences within the organization, the outfit, or the company, and appreciate the gifts that God has given for us, okay? So um, we're going to begin with genius in the New Testament. Oh, gosh, I only have 10 minutes. <laughs> genius in the New Testament. Uh, it should be revealed, sorry. Um, but here we are. It's concealed today because we are in Greek here. Don't worry about the Greek. I only need you to know um, how to spell and recognize seven Greek words in this course. All right. We will actually teach you how to recognize the entire alphabet, half of which you already know because of mathematics and advanced mathematics. You already know that. All right. So here are the dots in this particular sequence, right? Purple, blue, orange, green, pink, uh, gray, and red. This is the sequence in Modalities for Life that holds the key. And it is not the only sequence. Please take note, okay? This is not the only pattern of seven that there are. The pattern of seven is uh, mixed and uh, um, uh, shifted around. The sequence is changed depending on the historical period and what the 
the uh, writer was talking about. But in this sequence, um, this is the, yes, yes, thank you, uh, Pauline. This, uh, this is the anatomy zero. Yes, this is the first sequence. Perhaps it's the baseline sequence that we need you to know, but we need to you to know it in Greek. So if you look uh, Romans 12, six to eight up in any Bible dictionary, or online in the interlinear version. You just type in Romans 12, 6 to 8, followed by the words interlinear, interlinear and just hit enter. You will get a bilingual or a subtitled Bible. You'll have it in English, which as we have it here, we have it in English on the top. And then we have it in Greek at the bottom, transliterated, right? And then you'll have each of these Definition. So for prophetia, you read there, prophecy, prophesying, the gift of communicating and enforcing revealed truth, aletheia. Now, all of these you can study on your own. We will, we will um, drop this pack into the chat box or we'll send it to you. All right. So you can have this and it will be a guide for this particular sequence. And, but remember, this is not the only sequence, but it is the sequence that shows up most commonly in the New Testament. All right. But it is not the sequence that Moses, it is not the pattern that was revealed to Moses. It was the pattern that was revealed to Paul. And the pattern revealed to Paul contains seven elements. But the pattern uh, revealed to Moses also reveal, uh, contains seven elements, but those elements are ordered differently, right? They're, they're ordered differently in the sense that they, but, but let's just stay in Romans just for a moment and take a look. Each, what we are going to look at is the first three of these elements, the purple, the blue, and the orange for today. And we've given them, we've taken the acronym, we've taken, we've given them a sort of a, sort of a, like a tape, you know, periodic table. We've kind of taken the first three letters from pro fatia, and then we've made it into P-R-O for pro fatia, D-E-A, dia for diaconia, and DID for didactic. Now, I think we're just going to do three of these elements today. And then we'll recap uh, due to shortness of time. We'll recap and then uh, continue the last four uh, next week, next Monday. But, but this is what I want you to listen. As, as we go through this sequence, this particular sequence in Romans, um, which begins with purple, blue. It begins with purple. And the idea is that um, it has to do with the gift, the elemental gift of the eye. And uh, it is the prismatic vision that some people are um, given when they are born. This is not something you can, of course, you can learn it from a textbook, right? You can read my book on uh, Secrets of the Menorah. It's there. But that's not the point. The point is that there are some who have this prismatic proclivity or genius. This is the, the you know, this is the anatomy of genius. And this is the first element in the periodic table of human behavior. You see, Jung and Freud, they tried to predict behavior based on trauma, based on whether your mother, um, you know, did something to you or your father abused her or something like that. No, did we are not uh, fundamentally uh, creatures of uh, environmental creatures. We are fundamentally carrying the genes of and the genetics of Father God on this earth. In that sense, we are 
uh, direct creations, although we have a mother and a father and chromosomes and, and chemical makeup, the, the, as what Paige, if you li were listening carefully just now, ultimately our parenting um, is secondary. Who your father was, what, what, what was his genetic makeup, you know, when you can buy these kits, you know, 23 and me, uh, kits and go and find out, you know, you're pot Alaskan or maybe you're pot Hawaiian or Polynesian, 3% Norwegian, 5% Scottish, you know, all this, you know, maybe, you know, 1% uh, Jewish or something or Chinese. How many, I, I hear a lot of Filipinos that say, oh, you know, my grandmother, my great grandmother's cousin milkman who, you know, rode the Karabao, he was 25% Chinese. So that makes me 75% Chinese or you know, one one seventy fifth Chinese or something like crazy things like that. So we like to go into, and in fact, there's a denomination that. Do you know that there's a Christian denomination? I, I, um, does anyone know about the 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 Mormons? The the it, they're called the Church of the Latter Day Saints. Right. They go. You know about that? You, you've yeah. heard about these people, right? Yeah. They they wear yeah. white white shirts, yeah. huh? Many, many yeah, people. many, many. They they stand at train stations and bus stations. They wear white shirts, and they've got a little badge, mm -hmm. um, sort of identifying them as the Church yeah. of the Latter Day Saints. Yeah. And they all come out of um, the um, capital, which is uh, Salt Lake City in Utah, in America, and they have a university. Uh, and and yes, and lo yeah, lots of people know about the Mormons, right? Well, they um, have this passion or this obsession with your family tree that you have to go back and back and back, and you know, it become like the chapter one of the book of Matthew that you know this person begot this person begot this person, and finally, finally, you get to Adam. <laughs> right. Well, not many people can do that, but they apparently have all this genetic tools and, and they look at all your, your background. Now, there are some people that seem to see the world very differently. And many of them are scientists. Many of them are um, like, like this fella. Uh, uh, who what came out, you know, unraveled and uncovered the mysteries of planetary motion and light and, you know, developed the earliest telescopes together with Kepler and so on and so forth to where today we are actually sending uh, telescopes out into outer space and getting these brilliant um, images of what what we thought was nothing out there, but <laughs> suddenly when the images came back, my goodness, there we are just, this place is crowded with galaxies and we are just one little dot in, in a sea or an ocean of galaxies. Okay, so Isaac Newton, um, and, and another thing that they, they this uh, particular uh, characteristic or, or archetype, they are able to broadcast their ideas. And um, this gets them into a lot of trouble because sometimes they release ideas too soon and then they get crucified. <laughs> and, and, and some people are persecuted and seriously, they are shut down by by governments and, and some of them, uh, of course, many of the prophets were stoned and put in pit, pits and they sawed in two and they just kept their mouths open. Like John the Baptist would be a good example of this, okay? Uh, they chopped off his head at the end of the day, didn't like him at all, couldn't stand his, his words. Okay, uh, what else? Then we have, um, they're, they're very good at connecting dots and um, seeing, restoring defaults that other people cannot really understand. They, they, they go for a blue ocean, uncontested space. They don't like red oceans where everybody else is. They re-engineer existing ideas and they're always speaking in riddles with new vocabulary, okay? And then, like uh, Elon Musk, they want to bring a Tesla into space. People like that 
um, can be greatly misunderstood, um, but humanity would be the, the less for, for them, uh, frankly speaking. Um, you, you're not going to hire a profiteer and put them in leadership at a hotel, for example, because the hotel may change into a hospital or uh, you, you don't want profiteers in a pilot seat because the plane might not land where it's supposed to land, okay? Um, sometimes it can be extremely unstable. And if they don't turn their satellite dish towards heaven and to, towards the right source, then they will turn the satellite dish towards unnatural sources or demonic sources. And that's where you get cult leadership. Most masterminds, uh, whether you're talking about the, uh, you know, cult, uh, um, the uh, uh, Dravidians in Waco, Texas, or the Jim Joneses in, in Guyana, you know, and, and committing mass suicide. Most of these people are, how shall we say, they are masterminds. They usually write manifestos and they are able to, very good to radicalize um, unsuspecting people. That's why, by the way, um, you can have a dangerous uh, vocal profiteer who can call to arms uh, young people from other nations to buy air tickets and fly to your nation and join and sign up in this uh, sort of uh, militia that uh, uh, goes to war against and causes uh, dissension and rebellion against other people, uh, other governments. So it's 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 extremely it's the basis of both good and tr tremendous good and tremendous evil in the world. And um, uh, so this is the first genius. See, genius can be harnessed. And I believe every soul is ordained for greatness, but sometimes the soul is distracted from its course, its natural course, and the orbit is um, hijacked. And uh, that's where you run into problems. Yeah. Oh, okay. So uh, I think that's, that's, now, now we move to the second, um, which is the, the, the second circle, which is uh, the blue one, the mm -hmm. blue dot, blue dot. And the word is diaconia. And the short description, of course, we'd like all of you to be able to actually, don't, don't memorize these descriptions because these come straight from the interlinear um, uh, commentaries. This is just one person's you really do need to study these seven concepts and become really familiar with them. Okay. So, but the short description is diaconia is, you can see it in the, in the word deacon, right? Waiting at table, but there's a wider sense. There's a deeper sense of service and ministration. What they mean is that um, uh, it's the execution of some sort of plan, some sort of script, some sort of score. If, if you've noticed dancers or musicians, if you've engaged with artists, sculptors, <sighs> potters, um, these kinds of um, chefs, um, You'll you'll see this uh, this kind of thing in the Formula One world of motor racing. Um, take a look at this picture, courtesy of Formula One on Google. I pulled it out there. I love this picture because it shows that there is one person doing a very specific task to the best of their ability, and the combined effect is being able to change the tires of a Formula One car, race car, and fill up the patrol tank in under two seconds. Think about it. 
how long do you take to fill up your gas tank or your petrol tank? Right? For them, the time means everything. And so that's how they train to, you know, and one slip up will cost the, uh, the, the, the team uh, seconds and you could lose a race because something was put on wrong or something was not done in the most efficient manner. So that's this blue dot. Okay. Um, as you can see there, my wife has beautifully positioned the second dot there. And um, uh, if, uh, if any of you watch the movie, uh, the queen, uh, 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 Victoria's Last Love, um, it, it depicts this servant boy that uh, from Pakistan, I think, Urdu speaking, who rose from a bodyguard to becoming the, um, I think, Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs in India and Pakistan. And he taught the queen Urdu and he was excellent in his ministration of his genius and his gift. And he made a lot of money. And, and I, I mentioned this because it's, you can Google uh, Victoria's Last Love, or I think his name was Karim Abdul something. And you can Google, it's a black and white movie. And it's quite, it's a documentary about this guy whose name was erased from history. Because the British government was so embarrassed that Queen Victoria sort of had a crush on this Pakistani boy. <laughs> and um, eventually, of course, uh, she, she, she came to her senses and brought his wife and their children to England. But upon his death, they burned everything and all traces. He had a car. He had a golden carriage. He had... Um, uh, holiday flats and here and there because he had so much favor. You see, diaconias is the sort of archetype of excellent service. They are like um, able to wow the fans with their service and your, their bosses. And of course, cause a lot of jealousy as well if you don't you know, if you're if the bosses are not aware, then they are actually showing great favoritism to one at the expense of turning off other people. But this skill itself is much appreciated in society. For example, just now I was telling you that you don't put a profiteer in the cockpit of a commercial airliner. Well, what you want is a diaconia in the cockpit of a commercial airliner. With, no? three, with 300 no, no, people. With 300 no, no, people. Friday. Uh, with three, 300 people in the, um, in, the, um, in the passenger manifest list. You don't want people vomiting because the profiteer starts to fly up and down and left and right and give them all a joyride thinking that they, you know, they can get value for money. That's not the way to fly a commercial airline. However, if you want to be unpredictable and that unpredictable unpredictability gives value, then, then you will put him in a fighter jet because if you are predictable in a fighter jet, you are going to get shot down. Now, astronauts uh, also, they are able to... Um, uh, astronauts, astronomers who send telescopes up into the outer far reaches of the galaxy, they uh, are, they need to have perfected their craft and their art to such a point where um, they can reduce the number of, um, they call it uh, single point failures, uh, SPF, single point failures. They have identified in a rocket launch, maybe six or 700 single point failures. Meaning if at any time this particular system fails, then the mission fails. So at launch, 
there'll be like, you know, dozens of single point failures that you're watching to see whether the gates open, the, the engines fire up properly, the navigation guidance system is going well, the heat shields are on and blah, blah, blah. So many things can go wrong as they have gone wrong in time in past launches, as you can see. Uh, the uh, spaceship um, uh, Challenger, the space, uh, what is it called? The space, um, it's not a spaceship, but they call it a shuttle, this sh space shuttle Challenger. It blew up upon ignition because of a single point failure of the O-ring. Okay. So, okay, I, we, we can't go into full all, all the details of this, but just very quickly, um, like for example, Master Craftsman. I was uh, you you know I was talking about uh, the painter Fujimura and other. Here is this one. This particular one is uh, the Korean pottery masters. Their their hand their skill, um, which Gardner calls kinesthetic um, um, genius. You can if you are able to hold a pen and craft a knife or a sculpting device or something like that. Uh, even, even a stylus on a, uh, 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 a tablet. If you are able to uh, hold it steady, then you can, you, you can develop and hone that talent to a very, very high degree. And people pay millions for this sort of thing. Or, or indeed, you're very good at catching um, tuna in Japan. And, you know, I heard, I saw on one YouTube video that they could um, even auction, I think, the most expensive uh, and the biggest tuna in, the, in the, the first catch of the season for huge, you know, millions of yen or dollars, sorry. So this is the artisanal um, um, proclivity. Uh, behavioral pattern um, that re is represented in this blue dot here. And a lot of athletes, they are, they find themselves in the flow. Um, you think about people who have broken world records. Um, you think about the top chefs of the world. There are lots and lots of, um, you know, um, America's Got Talent and the Great Brit British Bake Off and a lot of these uh, uh, episodal sort of serial uh, shows uh, surround the excellence of um, athletes and bakers and and um, people in the Olympics, uh, people in, in, you know, sailing boats and, and even handicapped people who have lost their limbs, they are able to compete at world first class, world class standards. That is not by accident. That is by design. And um, um, just take note, there are some people like that as well. Okay. And um, that would, that, that, that are focused on masterful execution. Okay. The third and the last session I've already gone over my time already, but anyway, um, is the orange circle or the orange yellow circle, which is Didasco. And again, this is just a very cursory introduction to I, I, we, the pedagogic, uh, pedagogical genius, but I can't stress enough that um, within the body of Christ, this is greatly needed. The teacher, um, um, uh, uh, next week, we're going to look at the coach and the mentor. There are three different archetypes, but this one, the, the didactic or the pedagogical uh, intelligence is the one who is able to sort of break it all down and make it super simple to understand and uh, to, to and, and sometimes they are able to they will even admonish. They will even get very angry or irritated, um, uh, uh, and uh, uh, because you're not doing it the right way. <laughs> okay. So what's actually happening is that they 
they actually see the world in stunning clarity. They are able to correct the vision of society and sort of um, imprint values for the next generation. But, you know, they, like Gandhi, you know, he was assassinated point blank. People didn't like him. Some, some people, of course, made him into a god, which is not right. But there were clearly, he had enemies because he was speaking the truth. Nelson Mandela was similar to that, but then so was everybody, you know, who has this didactic genius. Um, they are able to synthesize from a multi multiplexity of ideas and uh, synthesize and bring, uh, uh, you know, disambiguate. In other words, with uh, cogent clarity, they are able to, um, you know, this is how they lead, right? It's with logic, end game logic. They solve problems. And um, in the word that I learned from uh, Wikipedia is the word disambiguation. And actually, the more, the clearer your, you, your vision is, the more power you have. And so this is where the scripture comes in, where it says, my people perish for lack of knowledge. And you don't have to be a theologian to know that. I mean, you know, just imagine you're going, uh, uh, he, coming here, uh, Singapore, for you're going to visit, visit me in Singapore. And you don't know, you don't have understanding of the costs involved, the transportation, your housing, you know, where do you stay, which hotel, can you get budget-friendly deals, you know, what season of the year, how do you travel by train and bus, all that is knowledge base. So if you, the more knowledge you have, the more pre pre prepared you are before you go on holiday, then hopefully you can save more money and see have greater value as well. So the idea of the disciplined mindset is one that is able to bring stunning simplicity and a total change of heart after you sit at the feet. And why do you why why do we have this um, English uh, uh, phraseology of sitting at the feet of someone? The reason is because. If you're going to learn something from a teacher, um, from some some sort of uh, expert, it will it will take not one or two sessions. It, you will have to kind of absorb the spirit of what the guy is saying. Not just you know I, I'm going to give you these slides, but it will do you no good if you don't understand. And and even the word understand, it's it's I always teach when I when I teach uh, English as a foreign language, for example, I use the word understand to stand under, right? To stand under uh, uh, under what? Under authority. If you submit to the authority of this person, then learning can begin. But if you have no respect for the teacher, then obviously you will you will not learn a single thing, right? And there are people even in, you know, there are people in, in, in every institution of learning, right? Who they, they think that, oh, I just paid the school fees and, you know, I deserve to learn and be taught and all this nonsense. That's why we have removed all tuition fees. This is a zero dollar uh, institute where everything is free because it's already paid for. The reason why we do that is because we only want people who really want to understand, to stand under. Uh, in uh, Zechariah 8.23, there's a verse that says, um, uh, in those days, 10 men from different nations and languages of the world will clutch at the sleeve of one Jew. Well, that one Jew is Jesus, right? And they will say, please let us walk with you, for we have heard that God is with you. So if you really want to walk with Jesus, you have to respect his authority. 
because he's going to bring you to the father. And when you come to the Abba father, the father is going to reveal your identity. You are going to know who you are through uh, the understanding of all seven of these dots or these uh, archetypes. So where do we have, where do we see the, the dots? Where do we see, how can we connect the dots with what already exists in the Old Testament? So this section, which I really need to go, wow, 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 okay, uh, I really need to go uh, quickly, is um, to, to look at the tabernacle. And um, I am not sure that I can actually complete this section, so I may have to come back to it uh next week but let me try to get it through as much as i can if you notice there is a different order of the dots because the different pieces of furniture are arranged <clears throat> from the most internal part of the tabernacle the holy of holies the inner sanctum where the presence of the Lord is right behind the curtain, which nobody is allowed to go in except the high priest once a year. And then from there to the holy place where you have three items, the altar of incense, showbread, the lampstand. And then it, from the more most private, it goes to the more less private. And then it goes to the open courtyard. Right. So in the courtyard, you have the laver and the fire altar. And then finally, you have the gate where it regulates the entry and out, coming in and going out. So if you line up the dots, if you connect the dots here, you'll find that um, the sequence is different from the sequence, the pattern revealed to Paul. This is the pattern revealed to Moses. And if you study this, and this will actually be part of a sort of, um, th this will actually be part of your uh, requirement for you to know this. There is another sequence that is embedded in the Old uh, Testament in the tabernacle. And that is based on seven words that um, is revealed in the book, the epistle of 1 John chapter 2. And in 1 John chapter 2, um, don't ask me how I came to this because I honestly, I don't remember, but I just remember like sort of waking up one day and then seeing these seven words jumping out at me and then looking them up in the Greek. And this is what I got, a different sequence, right? Green, gray, red, and each of the sequence, you know, orange had a different meaning, right? Purple, uh, pink, and then blue. And they spoke exactly of a template uh, in 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 to 6, the first six verses there. They gave this um, discreet insight into the tabernacle. And if you really study the history of the tabernacle and the artistry of the tabernacle, you'll find that God was trying to send a message. And in fact, this tabernacle of Moses is the basis, is the design component of every temple in the world. Every temple, every shrine, every, whether you're talking about Shintoism or Christianity, uh, whether you're talking about Catholicism, whether you're talking about Buddhism, if you look at uh, Sikh temples, you look at Jewish temples, you look at pagan temples, Greek temples, Roman temples, they all follow the same pattern. They all have the same pattern, which is enunciated, again, not by John in the New Testament, but by Paul, uh, by, uh, Paul 
in his epistle to the Corinthians. And in one verse, 1 Corinthians 14, 26, you will find all seven dots, uh, but in the order of the old tabernacle. So you've got the gray, which represents the gate, then red, which represents the fire altar, then orange, the laver for washing, purple, the lampstand, green, the table of fresh bread, blue, the altar of incense, pink is finally the Ark of the Covenant. And they represent the ecclesia gathered together under the leadership of the proistomy. So in 1 Corinthians 14, 26, in one verse, it says, when you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a, a teaching, a revelation, a tongue, an interpretation, let everything be done for the building up, the edification or the oikosification of the ecclesia. And the ecclesia is the temple made without hands. So if you're going, let's say, if you're forced to go into a Buddhist temple or a you're on tour or you don't have to be afraid. As my friend says in Thailand, the Akka chief, he says, Tayap, he, he told me, temples made with hands are only stone. Think about that. We are the temple made with living stones. And therefore, we are actually the fulfillment of the hopes and the dreams, the Theopolitan vision that we read in Revelation chapter 20 and 21 in the book of Revelation. The city on a hill that cannot be hid, though it may be assaulted by a battery of all kinds of demons, dragons, false prophets, and frogs, and all sorts of unclean things that come out of the sea, beasts with 10 heads and so on and so forth. That's why you sh you are pro probably pretty miserable as if you're a Christian and you're listening to the sound of my voice and you're going through some painful trial or transition. Well, it's probably not even your fault. You're just in the way of somebody else's battle, all right? There's a war going on, a war of saints going on. And then and, and, and the battle is between thrones, the th kingdom of heaven and the throne of Satan. Well, anyway, all that is done in, in history, but the today, what, what that leaves us with is the temple of God on earth, which is made up of a diversity of gifted individuals who um, have different types of contributions, energamata. Okay. So I don't know if uh, Paige is still on the call. Yes, I see her there. We're going to go to another, the last segment, and we're going to talk about um, a uh, design component by Peter Drucker, uh, who was a management guru in the last century. And he said, if you don't understand something, you can't put it, or if rather he said, if you, if you can understand something, you should be able to put it in a t-shirt. So this is the guideline for the t-shirt design. And we are going to be working. Uh, uh, we are, we are going to be uh, working uh, with um, uh, Bezalel uh, Creative. So 